Hi, I'm Jamie and welcome to uh, a discussion panel on weapons of mass instruction. Uh, I'm the managing partner at Lego Ventures, where we invest in the future of education and learning through play. Uh, I've got with me today five CEOs and founders um, who will give us some really interesting perspectives. Um, I will introduce them very quickly uh, and then we'll kind of get into the, into the meat of the conversation. Uh, so we have Damir. Damir is the co-founder and CEO of Photomath, the company behind one of the most popular education apps in the world. Photomath is using a mobile camera and AI to understand what the student is working on and software to generate step-by-step -step explanations and related learning content. We have Marcus. Uh, Marcus is the founder and executive chairman at Babbel. With over 10 million subscriptions sold, Babbel is the world's top grossing language learning app. Uh, with offices in Berlin and New York. We have Anand, uh, the CEO and founder of edX and professor at MIT. edX is a learning platform where 35 million learners from around the world come together to learn and upskill. As a global nonprofit, edX offers certificates and credentials from the majority of the world's top universities, such as Harvard and MIT, and leading corporations such as AWS and IBM. We have Matt, the CEO of Quizlet, the AI powered online learning platform used by over 50 million people a month to practice and master whatever they want to learn through adaptive study activities and recently valued at over 1 billion. He joined Quizlet from Google 12 years ago. Sorry, he joined Quizlet from after 12 years at Google, where he was most recently VP of product management at YouTube uh, and was on the founding team of Google Apps. Uh, and last but not least, we have Andrew. Uh, Andrew is the co-founder of Course Hero, an online learning platform with more than 40 million course materials uh, from students and 50,000 verified educators. With tutoring, textbook solutions, and support resources, they help students get unstuck and make every study hour count. Course Hero's North Star is to have every student graduate confident and prepared. Um, so first question to you all, uh, what is the key to making online learning work? And are there limitations to a digital only approach? And maybe we will start with Damir. Um, so what we are, what we are actually, uh, what, what I think is, is uh, key is to you know, design for the user as, and have the user first perspective. And while this should be logical, it is very often forgotten. So, uh, the time times where where it uh, worked uh, where, where it hasn't actually worked is uh, because of experiences that didn't take into consideration uh, or address the user's need and was designed for other factors like satisfying needs of other stakeholders which we see very often like optimizing payments uh, or, or thing, things like that. So we built our app to satisfy, uh, actually we built it to satisfy my needs as a parent, helping my children. And, and we are focused on, on users needs and I am this user and my kids are this user. And, and this is actually the major reason why people use and, and adopt us. Uh, and Marcus, uh, your perspectives. Um, I think there, there are some fundamental things that we have to have to look at, um, and I guess the the biggest the biggest uh, uh, thing we, we can't ever forget is we're doing this for humans. So this is not about machine learning. This is about humans learning. If we use machine learning in the process, that's that's absolutely fine and sometimes one, wonderful. But but um, I think in the tech world we we're uh, sometimes quick to forget uh, uh, that that human side. And that also entails that the, the best learning method is worth absolutely nothing if learners don't, don't use it on a regular basis. So I think the biggest hurdle and challenge in, in digital learning is engagement. Uh, very, uh, in contrast to a, to a real life classroom, you don't really go there. You don't have to schedule uh, so much. You don't have to get dressed uh, to use an app. And, and even if you, Many of, of these tools don't have a have a real teacher, so so you you're fundamentally missing uh, um, a human interaction there. And even if you have a teacher there, uh, that person is not in the room. 
and and can't express themselves in the same uh, in, in the same way that they could do in a in a uh, real space. So we're doing we're doing of course uh, self-directed online learning, and still I think that by far the most effective way to learn, especially languages, is with other people in the room. Um, the 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 uh, massive advantage, of course, is that you can use online tools everywhere anytime and it's it's a lot cheaper but but in the industry we tend sometimes to forget uh, the limitations over the uh, the advantages that the products that we build uh, have thank you um, and Anna just picking up on on one of the things that Marcus talked about there in, in respect to kind of engagement um, when you think about the key to making online learning work at edX, how do you think about engagement versus efficacy and getting the balance right between those two? I think, uh, uh, you know, both uh, Damir and uh, colleagues on the call are right about designing for, for people, for human beings, and engagement is critical to make online learning work. Um, at edX, we think about increasing engagement through a number of mechanisms. One is active learning. The pedagogy of our platform is active learning where Today's online learning is not your grandfather's online learning from the 90s. It's not just videos. Today we have videos, of course, but we have interactive exercises where people get instant feedback. We have gamification. Um, students form communities, their discussion forums where they get instant feedback from peers and others. And so these are some of the techniques of gamification and engagement that increases the likelihood that students will stick and complete. Community is very big for engagement as well, where in, the studies that have shown on edX, for example, that when people study together, the pass rate and the completion rates are higher. And there are techniques for engagement. Active learning is a known technique. This was invented in 1972 by a very, in a very famous paper by Craig and Lockhart. But you know, this was 50 years ago and we still don't adopt it in our colleges and universities. But on edX, we made it active learning a core part of the platform where the instructor has to interleave videos with interactive exercises. And, and there again, that's a proven technique to increase engagement of learners. Great. Uh, one of the things that some of you mentioned sort of explicitly when you talk about your businesses um, and your products, but I think is central to the way a lot of technology is moving now is, is AI. Um, and so I wondered, where you think we are on the path to, to genuinely personalize learning um, and how good current AI and, and machine learning is and, and how far does it have to go? Maybe Matt, you want to start us off? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. Uh, it is, it's probably the most talked about thing in, well, maybe every technology field, but definitely in, uh, in learning. Um, and I'd say the short answer is we've come a long way and made a lot of progress, especially over the last few years, but it's also important to ground in like, what is the goal, right? So I don't think the goal is some artificial general intelligence that's going to approximate a human and that you're going to interact with in some way, replacing, you know, teachers, educators, like that's just, that's, that's not realistic in, in any time soon. But where we have seen tremendous progress, and you've actually got great representation around this table of, you know, using technology and AI and in particular machine learning to help personalize pieces of the experience, right? To offload some of the redundant tasks, to be able to take things and actually take a general pathway and make it more personalized and more prescriptive for an individual in ways that you know every educator would love to be able to do they just don't have the time or scale from a human standpoint to do that so i think i think we've we've made significant progress and and it's represented in you know in all of the a number of the products that, uh, that that we all represent but we're also just starting to scratch the surface we've got a long ways to go and i think you know probably top of mind today especially are things like, you know, where, how do we make sure that we're building machine learning models that don't include too much bias? How do we make sure, you know, I agree with, uh, with Damir and Marcus uh, that we, we need to really focus on solving the true user problems. We need to make sure that we've got good representation of the people doing that. I mean, you know, 
shouldn't it shouldn't go unmentioned that we've got four middle-aged men, five, sorry, six middle-aged men sitting around this table. We don't have strong representation in this group and we need to, right? Uh, and so I think as we think about AI, there's a lot of promise, but there's also still a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do. I think that depends on your definition of middle age, Matt, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Matt, I speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we don't have the gender representation that we definitely need in, uh, in this group. And, uh, and, we, and it's up to us as, as leader. I mean, that's a bit of an aside, but it's up to us to, to fix it. And, and as it ties to AI, I think it is a very important topic, right? If we're training our respective machine learning models on the data from privileged upper middle class people, then we might be unintentionally leaving leaving others behind, et cetera. So, you know, I think it, I think there's so much promise, but I do think there's a lot of uh, hype that we have to be uh, that we have to be aware of and 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 cognizant of as as leaders as we build these uh, these technologies and these companies. Thanks. Um... Dan, AI is obviously very central to, to your business. Um, what are your thoughts? So, uh, machine learning, machine learning is, of course, like already very good, and it will get better. Uh, problems are it's it's and and like this is what what scientists are actually focused on. Uh, it is not not interpretable, so uh, we, we cannot we can't rely one hundred percent on results that it. it provides so uh, and you can see all these scandals you know uh, that that you know a result of relying exclusively on machine learning uh, or actually maybe not exclusively on machine learning but something that people claim is machine learning and and of course it's like catastrophic results sometimes and we, and we need to be aware that machine learning has its limitations uh, uh, we need to make sure that products that are built on machine learning are actually taking these limitations into into uh, 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 account. And but you know, software uh, and we are working on this. Software can actually explain and teach really well uh, if you if you you know know exactly what what student uh, needs. So it's not even about machine learning. Machine learning is like everybody likes you know, to talk about machine learning. But you know, when you go deep into it, it's not so so simple. It's not simple at all. Uh, again, machine learning, as, as Marco said, you need a very good user interface and good user experience for machine learning backend. If you want somebody to use it at all, or if you want this to be effective at all. So uh, yes, machine learning is great, is good. It will get better, but actually, uh, a lot of other things that we need to to be careful uh, uh, about when we when we use and talk about machine learning thanks uh, and marcus i know you feel quite strongly about this topic where where is where are your thoughts well babel is in in the field of language learning and that's a, a field where where ai is particularly struggling because because uh, um there's still the idea uh, of adaptive learning which has developed especially in in, in around math topics which is which is uh, uh, makes a ton of sense because a computer can make a math problem uh, easier and harder for a human um, uh, dynamically. Uh, with language, it's a lot more comp complicated. And to be honest, uh, um, computers and, and all the algorithms still lag behind humans in, in natural language. So they can't really teach teach language and and adapt to to uh, uh, what how we are learning. Um, so, so I'm I'm relieved that that I hear also in this round uh, quite a realistic view uh, on on AI, and very very often this uh, um, machine learning and AI in our industry is sold as the wonder drug drug and and the magic thing, and you don't need a teacher anymore. And I think that's that's not only wrong; it's really dangerous. Um, and and uh, of course, it opens up new areas where we can can just use new methods of, of interactions. Um, and, and these are really exciting. The, the only issue is that the whole system that we're in, the industry, our investors, our customers, and so on, so much want to hear, oh, yes, we're using AI here and there, that, that the value has been completely inflated and, uh, of, of what it can actually deliver. We're expecting magic. And 
what we what we get is far from it. So so I think I think especially in education we have to be careful to be realistic about what technology can do, um, because we have I think we have a responsibility for for delivering quality to our customers. Yeah, Mark. And, and, if, and if I could jump in, I, I think Mark, as to your point, it's uh, it's probably overly mis misrepresented or overly simplified as like some big monolithic thing of oh, AI will do will will be this thing that solves the whole problem. And in reality, as we all know as technologists, it's a machine learning model applied to this specific type of feature set that's one piece of a huge puzzle to make the whole thing work, right? And as you said, Demir, it also includes great user interface so that you can make sense of the UI and make it or make of the AI and make it useful, et cetera. So it's not, you know, I think we overly simplify it in marketing and, and whatnot to represent it as some big monolithic magic solution, but in reality, it's bits and pieces of technology that when assembled together can create really powerful learning, you know, learning tools and technologies that do have, you know, massive advantage and, and high efficacy. Yeah, I think Marcus and Matt, that's it's really interesting. I think a lot of the times I think about how time passes in our mind so much faster than the ability for us to execute. So I think it's incredibly important to place ourselves at a particular moment in time to understand uh, for different stakeholders, what is the expectation? And I think, I mean, first of all, it is incredibly exciting to be able to talk about the power of machine learning and AI, because that is the next level of automation, cost reduction, personalization, and that's the dream. And it is possible to exercise some of that value today, and especially when you're talking over the next single digit years or a decade. But I think if you step back from it and you look over the last decade, what has been incredibly powerful is the amount of work that has been put into building the companies in this panel. It didn't happen overnight. And the, the option to exercise this value is because a certain amount of scale has been reached. And we're talking about tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people that are being able to be uh, reached built on platforms where the fixed costs and variable costs are super low. And that's the power uh, that these platforms have and education has is to be able to reach millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, maybe more of, of students and being able to have the marginal cost of production be super low, whether it's software costs, um, hosting costs, storage costs, et cetera. Um, those marginal costs are super low. And that's, that's a really powerful thing. So now that you can reach so many different people and you can help students then the question is, how can you actually start to personalize this? And that's why it's so topical. Um, but as we pointed out, it is one function within a tool set in which to invest to get to that outcome. You no, know, I think that's a really important point, Andrew, which is that personalized learning uh, should not be viewed as uh, kind of the holy grail and that's all we do. It really should be one aspect of a tool set uh, of learning. You know, there are studies that show that when people learn together, their uh, outcomes are better. And uh, that's a community. Now, personalized learning by its very nature is individualized. And personalized learning is very lonely. And so you want communities as well, and you want community-based learning. So let's not, you know, as technologists, we all get carried away, uh, you know, and we have had uh, experiments with a number of AI-based personalized learning courses on edX. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the technology, but let's keep in mind that community-based learning uh, can actually result in much better outcomes. And so we'll actually end up having both modes and maybe we have personalized learning where you need to be tutored very quickly on something, but then we work in a community or a group and learn together. And so we just have to mix and match these approaches. I mean, if I, if I, Andrew. If I may, oh, sorry. I, 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 we probably need to keep moving just with the, the time limited. Um, but Andrew, I want to pick up on something that you said and then and then come back to you with it. So you talked about the ability to reach tens or hundreds of millions of people with, with the companies that, that this panel has, have been involved in creating. Um, but the adoption of, of ed tech has sometimes and in certain arenas been quite slow. Um, so what do you think have been the biggest hurdles to the adoption of digital learning? Uh, and do you believe that, that ed tech is seen as 
friend or foe to traditional learning institutions? And is, and is that changing? And, and just as you think about the answer, if there's, if there's anyone kind of listening to the webinar um, that is an educator, we'd be really interested afterwards in the Q&A section in, in what your views might be um, or any questions or challenge you may have on, on that idea of, of friend or foe. Yeah, I think related to what I was saying before, to build on that, we, we really say in our minds, we have this idea and this vision of what I want to accomplish, what we want to accomplish. And we say, I want to help as many students succeed, as many students ask and answer questions, learn, study, graduate, confident, and prepared. But to actually accomplish that and make progress, that doesn't take one year, two year, three years. That, you know, it, it's taken a decade to get to this scale. And actually putting in the time and effort and the, the determination, the perseverance, the passion to be able to live through that and make progress step by step is incredibly difficult. And I think so many people have the passion to want to do that. But I think some of the difficulty is, I think in education in particular, I think one needs to have a long time horizon in which to be able to compound value over a longer period of time and not expect it to happen in, in a really short period. And then I think it's really powerful. I love hearing that multiple people on this panel, panel think about optimizing and building for a user in mind, a student in mind. And I think that's what we've done. And I think what's powerful on this panel too is there didn't used to be a, a you know, 10 plus years ago, a definition of ed tech, that word is new. Uh, also, most models were totally top down in terms of distribution. And I think when building first to a student and being something supplemental, something that um, can facilitate an amazing teacher or tutor with you as a student, in addition to whatever resources you have, that's really powerful. However, to actually build for one user is incredibly difficult. But think about then when you actually are dealing in an ecosystem with multiple stakeholders and you actually have to understand all of their problems, their challenges, their incentives, their motivations from a student to a tutor, to a parent, to an educator, to a publisher, to a school, to a district, you name it. And I think we believe in building a platform that over time really understands those issues, those incentives, those motivations, and how do you actually build product marketing content understanding for all of the stakeholders? And in what sequence can you do that? And the reality is you can't do it all at once or at the beginning. And so you have to make choices. But I think that's, that's another one of those challenges that I think people see is with a limited set of resources, what choices are you gonna make? And which users are you gonna build the best experience for? But then as you scale, how do you incorporate more and more people into the tent? Because that's what we're all here to do, however the approach is is how do we help facilitate learning, creativity, success uh, for students throughout grade levels, throughout geographies around the world? How do we create access? How do we create more affordability to higher quality, amazing learning experiences for, for more students, for more educators around the world? And uh, I think that's what motivates so many people and what's so exciting about what's happening in education right now, but it's all been on the backdrop of multiple years to get here. And Anand, you, you know, edX is, is partnered with, with some of the leading universities um, in, in the way that it works and in what you do. What has that journey been like in terms of trying to get the traction, trying to get the buy-in? Was, was it easy? Did it take years of effort? Um, what, maybe give us some insight. You know, uh, you know, Jamie, to go back to your original question, uh, why has it taken so long for online learning to be adopted? What are the impediments to adoption? I think it's one single word. It begins with the letter F, it's familiarity, which is that people are unfamiliar with online learning, whether it's professors, universities, or students. And the lack of familiarity simply has not brought hordes of people to come in to do online learning. You know, it's, it's simply, you know, I used to carry a flip phone and smartphones came out and I never changed to a smartphone because it was new. I had no idea how to use it. But when my flip phone broke and I started using my smartphone, I said, oh my God, an OMG, and as my daughter would say, I can't believe it. 
how could I not have done this before? And frankly, I think that's one of the biggest uh, impediments to online learning, but COVID has changed all that. Um, in March of this year on edX, uh, before COVID, uh, and after, you know, when COVID started uh, at least hitting our country in the US here, uh, we saw a 10X, not 10%, 10X increase in enrollments on edX uh, during the COVID times. And large numbers of faculty and students began trying out uh, online learning. Faculty from teaching completely on campus in person went to 100% teaching remotely. And what I'm hearing from colleagues and universities and learners is that 80% of the faculty who have now tried it are either now neutral to it or liking it, whereas before they would said they would never touch it. One of my colleagues said after his first online lecture, he said at MIT, he said, today I gave my most engaging lecture through, you know, through the whole semester this year because they went online half of the semester. So I think the COVID moment has taken us to a new normal that online learning for faculty and universities is going to be big. And so before COVID, it was hard to get people to either try it out or learn or teach courses. But post COVID, uh, it's suddenly become a lot easier where more people have become familiar with it. I think one, one of the things you spoke about there obviously is familiarity, um, which is certainly true. Um, but I think one of the things that struck me statistically is education was the least penetrated digital sector prior to COVID and has seen, has seen the biggest jump. Uh, and there's another thing that you mentioned there, um, uh, and I'll maybe ask Matt this, but is the need to get the teachers on board, um, the lecturers on board, the faculty on board, as well as the students, and whether playing to, to an audience of different constituent parts uh, who have different needs from a product is part of the reason they get that adoption. Yeah, I think, um, I actually think that, you know, simply put, uh, Andrew touched on this a moment ago, like the, the first generation of ed tech, you know, for the last decade plus was about bringing technology into the traditional system of education, trying to automate the system as it exists or trying to quote, disrupt that system. And I think what the majority of the companies that we all represent actually, you know, kind of a different approach, which is we, we don't even refer to ourselves as an ed tech company. We think of ourselves as consumer learning, which is taking technology directly to the end user. In this case, the learner, the student, the parent and Damir, you know, I love your example, Damir, about the, the parent is also the, the, the user of a uh, of photo math guilty. Um, you know, and, and it's, but it's, so it is, it is about awareness of that technology, but it's also about serving, you know, meeting that user, going back to the very original discussion about meeting the user where they are, understanding their needs and being there to serve that need, not necessarily in place of the traditional education institution, but in support of, in, you know, augmenting, supplementing and helping, you know, we're not, we're not trying to replace the classroom, we're definitely not trying to replace the teacher, we're trying to empower the student and, and to your question, I think teachers, teachers, educators at, at any level are important constituents. Um, they're, you know, they're a big user of our platform, you know, we have millions of monthly active uh, educators on the platform, and that's great. But our core user that we serve is really the learner and, and teachers are uh, a partner in that learning and a conduit for that learning. And so I think the real shift of why, like why now, I do think, you know, and I'll, I'll both agree and disagree with you. I agree that COVID is sort of a reawakening on the B2B ed tech side because we're forced to say, hey, where can technology help us in a distance, remote, you know, non-in-person model? But I think, you know, the big, the, the stepwise change over the last five years or so has been consumer grade technology that empowers the end learner, um, you know, whether it be language learning or helping, helping with their math homework or helping with their college courses or helping them study, et cetera. Uh, and I think that's really the fundamental change where we're seeing, we don't exclusively rely on the educational institution to provide everything you need to learn something anymore. We're saying, no, there's actually amazing technology out there to help you in that endeavor. And in, in some cases, perhaps replace it where, you know, maybe I don't need to take Spanish in high school anymore because I can uh, learn it on Babel or, or, or similar. Um, if there's anyone listening, by the way, who, who has any questions for the panel, um, now's the time to start thinking of those and getting those down. Um, but before we get there, 
uh, and just picking up on that theme map, um, and maybe I'll come to you, Marcus, on this one. Uh, but what role do you think direct to consumer sort of self-directed digital learning plays versus the traditional education system? You know, we've got we've got people on this panel who um, work very much inside the education system and, and supplementary to, to the education system and, and in class learning. Uh, and then, you know, Babel, for example, is very much direct to consumer in the way that it teaches language. And, and how do you see those two sitting side by side? My feeling is that the the direct to consumer products usually usually are more for adults and and not for for students that are still in the in the formal education system. So that's a, uh, at least true for for almost all our uh, learners. Uh, many most of them are beyond twenty five. Um, I think there's there's. A, other than our product, there's there's quite a number of products that can complement uh, um, uh, learning at, uh, uh, institutions, educational institutions. Um, but but there's one thing we we I'm sure nobody who has who is a parent uh, can forget in these times. There's more to schools than just kids learning something. So, uh, it's also parents being able to work. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, so we haven't had any kids running through the, through our screens yet in this panel, but but you've all seen it. You all had it in the in these uh, uh, COVID times, and and I think there's there's uh, a fundamental uh, um, function of of, of uh, education institutions, and that is very social, uh, and that's a social experience. So um, kids can't meet their peers just on screen. And that's, that's a tremendous problem right now that they, in very many countries, live. Um, for, for people being with other people, that's, that's what we inherently we, we are built for as humans. And, and uh, I think that is what we also experience in education. And, and very often, even in secondary uh, and tertiary ed education, we have that that very social factor. Um, so I think our tools are uh, supplements to the existing system, and they open up a completely new corridor of learning that is in a completely different age group. So if you're if you're 45 and thinking about learning Italian or or uh, uh, learning some something new, then the the uh, ability to do so has has just tremendously exploded. So, so it's just at your fingertips. Whatever you want to learn, you can learn uh, by by means of digital apps. And I think that has opened up uh, um, so many so many horizons for people and can be absolutely life changing. Um, and I think that is where direct to consumer learning absolutely uh, uh, excels and and uh, makes a tremendous impact. Thanks. Uh, and Andrew, where do you, where are your thoughts on, on this question of the direct to consumer versus the traditional education system? Yeah, I, I think that was in building on your previous question too, and when, when to incorporate other stakeholders. I think there's a nice word there that Mark is just to compliment in addition to, you know, thinking about it as a supplement and for us, um, I'm not, you previously uh, just mentioned the word active learning and how that's really a fundamental driver for people who are engaged um, in, in the institution and educators. And we found that as we really started building about three or four years ago to incorporate uh, college level instructors from North America into the, into the platform, really it, it was on the backdrop of a shift from about 50% of College level instructors in 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 U.S. post secondary education being tenured or tenure track to really it being about uh, under thirty percent, maybe even under twenty five percent today. So seventy percent of faculty are actually uh, contingent and adjunct um, instructors, and they don't get the recognition or celebration for the incredible work that they're doing and the the focus that is really on teaching as opposed to really an orient orientation towards research. 
And what we found is that they, they are so complementary and driven by helping students succeed and being student first in this, to use the language of this panel, uh, consumer learning first. And what we found is that that sort of adoption has been really, really accelerated to now over 50,000 educators in college on the platform in the United States and Canada on, on Course Hero. And largely because these are teachers who really believe in active learning. And I think you can find that common denominator of what is aligned between these different audiences from students to parents to educators to schools. I think that's where you find this elegance in something that's really powerful. Uh, to bring people together. And for us, um, I think that's how um, really building on the success of a platform that reaches tens of millions of students on a monthly basis, helping them get access to questions and answers and explanations to on-demand tutors, uh, to learning materials. That was really a powerful way to to sequence a building from just students to tutors to educators and then schools for us. Um, what, one question I have here, which picks up on, on a point that Marcus made actually, um, revolves around, so you, so you mentioned Marcus, the, the stat that most of your learners are over 25 and, and direct to consumer seems to work best for adults. Uh, and the question is, is it important or is it a problem that, that direct consumer works predominantly for adults and for kids? And, and I think, you know, if I, if I offer a quick perspective from, from a Lego Ventures point of view, from an investor point of view, and then, you know, I'll open the floor to, to whoever wants to comment. But I think, you know, the school system is, is very structured learning. Um, and kids or, or anyone learns best when they're following a passion and when it's intrinsically motivated. And, and a word I've heard a lot um, on this panel, which I, I thoroughly agree with, is, is this idea of active learning. Um, and I think for kids, there is that that shared kind of issue of, of the parent and the child that, that has also been mentioned. Um, but it is really important to solve the problem of how to deliver direct to consumer learning for kids that they want to do uh, and that is successful in competing for, for mind share in the, in the time that they have. Um, but I wonder if anyone else thinks that that it's a problem at the moment that it's largely adults that are engaging in, in direct to consumer successfully. No, Jamie, I'm not sure that's true at all. Uh, uh, you know, I found out about Course Hero uh, from uh, my daughter and my son. And, uh, you know, kids are involved in online learning and uh, all these online platforms. On edX, for example, of our 35 million learners, we have learners from the age ranging from four and a half years to 98 years. Now, it is true that uh, the median age of the learner is 26. Uh, but that said, you know, the median age of the learner, uh, you know, in a typical country is uh, 40, you know, maybe 40 years. And so uh, in that sense, uh, learners of all ages are coming to platforms and frankly if you look at b2c businesses they've been driven and look at the media and you know look at games and so on they're driven by kind of the generation that ranges in age from uh, 20 to 30 perhaps and uh, and i think that's the same is true for online learning. We have courses at the high school level taken by high schoolers as well as the teachers we have courses at the college level taken by college age and of course the revenue comes a fair bit actually from people that are skilling up and professionals who want to who want to earn credentials like professional certificates and say uh, Python programming or machine learning and so on, uh, a significant part of the revenue comes there. But if you look at the large catchment of learners coming in, it's it's all ages. Yeah, I think that's powerful, and I'm sure Damir and, and and Matt here, I'm sure the vast majority of of, of your users are are definitely uh, middle school, high school. Uh, in, in students that are, you know, uh, under 18. And I think something surprising for us is that in college in the United States, actually over a quarter of all students are 26 or older. And so that's just a different image uh, than I think most people have of what a college student looks like uh, is, is actually they are working, they are parents, uh, 
and and we they aren't that 18 to 24 year old student only. Uh, and so I, I think uh, potentially if we just look at age, uh, we we might not understand the distributions of what's the reality of of the face of education. Yeah, I think it's a lot about the, the you know, when I agree, Andrew, and obviously we have, you know, tens of millions of under 18 year olds who use Quizlet. I know Demir does as well. And, uh, you know, it's really about moving from, you know, kind of where the, where the direction or where the motivation is coming. And so, yeah, a middle school student on Quizlet might be more teacher directed or, or, or parent directed. A high school student might start to become more self-directed and a college student is and or a professional vocational learner is fully self-directed so i think it's i think it's there's a motivation spectrum and you know jamie you mentioned like you know there's learning through you know creativity and play like like on lego for example which can be very self-directed at, at a younger age right um so i do think you know i think there's you actually see direct to consumer working across the age spectrum and it's really like what's the what's what's the driving force and it, it does change as a as a learner ages and goes through kind of the formal education system into adulthood and, and more completely self-directed professional vocational learning yeah and then users actually younger users they expect direct to consumer learning they don't want anything else and they, they are actually mobile mobile driven you know like this is what they they want and we, we uh, you know there is this creativity that is happening on you know like uh, all the young people on you know uh, youtube or on snap or on tiktok or on other platforms and this is because uh, this is you know uh, they have tools and they have their their phones uh, or computers more, more phones and they can express and also on this platform they expect this will also come to them in terms of you know learning experience and and uh, we we need to build this great learning experience digital learning experience they are using these great actually consumer apps and they want you know the great this consumer experience when they are learning yeah and i don't and i agree and i don't think that means that we're i don't think any of us are predicting the end of traditional education especially yeah. especially in primary and secondary right where community is so important you know we're not we're not foreshadowing some dystopian future where education goes away completely and everybody has to you know is left to fend for themselves uh, but i completely echo your point amir of like the expectation now especially for younger students, younger learners is a massively high quality consumer grade experience. Not not too different actually than maybe the the same trend that we saw a decade ago in kind of enterprise tech where you went from traditional yeah. bad, horrible UIs in like enterprise software to really consumer grade capabilities in collaboration and work. And I think the same thing happens in uh, in education and learning. You know, there's a happy there'll be a happy medium actually where I don't think learning is going to go purely B2C or purely through uh, colleges. I think uh, uh, the future of learning is blended. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We're, we're about to get cut off. Um, so I just want to wrap up very quickly and say thank you to everyone. It's been, it's been fascinating for me.